Hi, my name is Allison Feeder from the University of Washington, and I'm excited to tell you today about why I think space is the final frontier in our quest to overcome some of the most pressing threats to human health. A fundamental challenge that limits our ability to manage many diseases is that the disease-causing agents, like bacteria, viruses, or cancerous cells, evolve inside our bodies. These evolutionary processes cause drug resistance or immune escape, more aggressive disease, and potentially the ability to colonize new cell types or parts of the body. A comprehensive understanding of interest evolution stands to unlock more evolution-proof treatment strategies, mechanistic insights into the forces driving disease progression, and the ability to predict and ultimately steer disease outcomes. However, a potentially crucial and under-investigated driver of interest evolution is the spatial organization inside our structurally complex and heterogeneous bodies. Evolutionary theory tells us that space can be an important evolutionary driver, but we have few examples where we actually understand how spatial organization makes populations reach meaningfully different evolutionary outcomes. A major reason we lack these examples isn't that they don't exist, but because until relatively recently, the spatial organization of pathogens inside the body was just really hard to measure. Most collection approaches, like say blood draws, are non-spatial and destroy potentially critical information about the diverse environment shaping these populations. Now, however, we're in a new era of spatial biology. The development and applications of new technologies have given us unprecedented resolution into the spatial organization of intrahost pathogens, and so we're now poised to understand how and if space drives phenomena like drug resistance or disease progression. Although we're now collecting extensive spatially resolved intrahost data, it still turned out to be challenging to leverage these data towards actionable insights, and the fundamental limitation has been a lack of quantitative frameworks in which to analyze them. So my overarching research goal is to pioneer computational approaches that integrate emerging spatial and genetic data with evolutionary models to understand when and how space shapes intrahost evolution, and by doing so, develop interventions that can prevent or eliminate disease. And these goals transcend any individual system. My lab works on how space impacts intrahost evolution in viruses, bacteria, and cancer. As I hope I'll convince you during this talk, Developing new quantitative approaches to understand spatial intrahost data reveals that space does impact whether populations do things like evolve resistance or persist through treatment or progress towards more malignant phenotypes, and understanding these spatial processes can yield actionable insights that improve human health. And I want to start today with HIV drug resistance evolution, which I started working on as a model system to understand rapid adaptation broadly and not space specifically. However, this line of inquiry led me to the conclusion that considering HIV spatially is crucial if we want to design therapies that minimize resistance evolution. So, in the early days of the HIV epidemic, we treated HIV with single drugs, which quickly failed because enormous HIV populations could really easily produce single mutations that conferred a high degree of resistance. Now we treat HIV with combinations of three drugs, which target multiple distinct stages of the viral life cycle. Therefore, even if a virus gets a single mutation, which we know happens readily in monotherapy-treated populations, that virus shouldn't be able to spread because it's still suppressed by two other drugs. Viruses should need to have multiple resistance mutations accumulate on the same genetic background before those mutations can spread in a population, and the expected rate of production of these multiply resistant mutants is very small. So, as a result of triple drug therapies, intrahost resistance evolution went from a certainty to an increasingly rare event, which is wonderful. But the story is more complicated than it first appears, because we started giving triple drug therapies in 1995, and the average number of resistance mutations emerging in a person in a year of treatment remained elevated far beyond the expected rates. We wanted to know why. Why don't combination therapies work as well as we think that they should? To try to understand what was going on, we analyzed decades of HIV clinical resistance data and found a number of observations that diverged strikingly from our expectations. The first surprise is the one I already mentioned. Resistance evolution remained common even after giving multidrug therapies. The second surprise relates to our expectation that viruses carrying only a single resistance mutation shouldn't be able to spread on their own in a combination therapies. Multidrug treated populations are therefore expected to be fully resistant or completely non-resistant. However, when we looked at clinical trials tracking people treated with combination therapy, we found that many of them harbored viruses with just one or two detectable resistance mutations instead of three. We expanded this analysis to include many different types of triple drug therapies, and similarly found many intrahost viral populations had only one or two resistance mutations. So what this suggested to us is that at least some of the time, mutations aren't spreading in groups of three, but actually one at a time. Third, as is suggested by the plot, it seems like the order in which these mutations are spreading isn't random. First, populations become resistant to the dark blue, then yellow, then light blue. 
The pattern also held true more generally. So if we looked at the singleton mutations that we identified above and asked to which drug does the singleton mutation confer resistance, the answers were predictable across many therapies, normally the drug class represented by the dark blue. Finally, we wondered whether this resistance was due to transmitted resistance instead of de novo evolution of resistance on therapy. So we asked, what's the probability of measuring a resistance mutation in a person for the first time in a given year of treatment? And we found that while rates of resistance were elevated in the first year of treatment, presumably due to transmitted resistance, there was still a lot of resistance evolution after years of treatment. Okay, so summarizing, we found resistance evolves on combination therapy via single mutations in a partially predictable order and even years after therapy. And we think that these observations can help us understand how resistance emerges. So we modeled two potential explanations. And the first one is, and by far the most common explanation for why HIV continues to evolve drug resistance, is that there's temporal heterogeneity in drug levels. So fast decaying drugs may leave the system first, giving the opportunity for slower decaying drugs to select for partially resistant viruses, especially when exacerbated by incomplete drug adherence. However, when we actually went in and implemented carefully calibrated models of temporal heterogeneity in drug levels under multiple models of drug adherence, we found that while temporal heterogeneity could allow single mutations to spread, and in a particular order, actually very little resistance evolution was detectable and basically none of it after the first year of therapy. The reason is that resistance mutations carry substantial fitness costs in the absence of the drug, which creates a Goldilocks principle of drug levels. Drug levels must be low enough for replication, but high enough to select for resistance. And these conditions only happen at, at small viral population sizes. And this makes it challenging for viruses to produce the correct mutation at the correct time. Temporal heterogeneity alone, therefore, couldn't explain the ongoing patterns of resistance to triple drug therapies. However, when we expanded the model to explicitly incorporate measurements of drugs in different parts of the body, accounting for the reduced drug concentrations crossing the blood-brain barrier and allowing viral migration between different anatomical regions, we found that it was much more straightforward to explain all of the unusual observations we'd seen in the clinical data. Areas with strong penetration from the best drug in a combination therapy created an enduring area where resistance could be selected, permitting single resistance mutations conferring resistance to the most penetrant drug to be detectable in the blood, potentially even years of, after viral suppression. And I'll note here that this dark blue class of drugs has notably good penetration into the central nervous system, unlike many drugs given in the early days of combination therapies. What this suggests to us is that spatial heterogeneity in drug levels plays an important role in permitting the evolution of resistance in HIV, especially in the earlier days of combination drug therapies comprised of less penetrant drugs. Incorporating knowledge about that spatial heterogeneity helps resolve the mystery of HIV's ongoing resistance evolution, and it suggests practical considerations about how we should design drug therapies in the future. We need to be careful about the component drugs and how they work together. Counterintuitively, you may not want to use a drug with very strong penetrance if it can't be paired with other strong penetrance drugs, because this can create monotherapy that selects for resistance. Exploiting these principles is helping us build a framework to evaluate and optimize combination drug therapies, especially as data about spatial drug concentrations becomes more precise. We've been working with Angela Kashuba's lab at UNC, who have made really striking measurements about different HIV drugs in the context of single tissues. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a gut cross-section. And they've discovered that drugs can have wildly different and non-overlapping penetration profiles. Now, we want to understand how this heterogeneity opens up even further pockets of single drugs where resistance can be selected. But more broadly, we think that the analytical framework that we're building that exploits an understanding of evolution in complex spatiotemporal environments will be an important weapon in our arsenal in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. So, at least in HIV, our work suggests that space does indeed matter for intrahost evolution. But experiencing different environments across space isn't restricted to HIV, so we've set out much more broadly to understand how space drives disease across systems, and one more spice likely matters a lot is tumors and their microenvironments. Like pathogens, cancers emerge via an evolutionary process of repeated mutation and competition, where understanding this process enables more informed clinical decision-making and prevention efforts. Here, I've marked different mutations occurring during tumor expansion in different colors. But understanding the spread of these mutations may very well be insufficient to understand the tumor progression, depending on the extent to which growth phenotypes depend on the environment that the tumor is experiencing. So cells in different parts of a tumor have differential oxygenation, pH, and progrowth signaling from fibroblasts based on their position near the tumor periphery. We know that these variables affect growth in vitro, but just because we can measure that these cells occupy these different environments, this doesn't tell us how much the microenvironment actually affects growth in vivo in actual clinical tumors. 
Despite now having spatial measurements, we need new computational tools to draw out quantitative biological insights from those measurements. So we propose that we can build these tools by leveraging the division history of a tumor encoded in its genome. The degree of mutational sharing between two cells from a tumor tells us about how recently they diverged, and we can use these shared mutational relationships across many parts of a tumor to build a phylogenetic tree. We think that we can use tree shapes and branching patterns to gain insights about environmental drivers of growth at preclinical times. So we developed a method called STEVO, which aims to quantify how a specific discrete trait, for example, a position in a tumor, center or edge, changes the overall growth rate on a phylogeny. So what we can do is take genetic samples from multiple portions of a tumor, annotate these samples based on whether they were captured near the center or the edge, and then Stevo simultaneously infers the relationships between the different cell populations to construct a tumor history, and importantly, infers the growth rate associated with being in the center or the edge. The core idea behind this is that if certain parts of the tree are expanding faster than others, they'll leave signatures of that expansion in the tree shapes, and we can read those out quantitatively. We applied Stevo to a data set of spatially sampled hepatocellular carcinomas and discovered patterns consistent with a three to five times faster growth rate on the tumor exterior than the tumor inside, suggesting extreme growth rate differentials, not driven by driver mutations, but by the spatial context of individual cells. This supports growth mode predictions previously restricted to xenograft experiments and provides quantitative insights into the degree to which microenvironment governs tumor growth in vivo. And I just want to emphasize again why I think this is so exciting. We start with this hypothesis, the outside of a tumor may be growing faster than the inside, and Stevo learns this pattern directly from annotated genetic sequencing data. Although we've been applying Stevo to understand the impact of boundary-driven growth on tumor development, we think it has much more general applications. For example, we could annotate these samples not by center or edge, but by hypoxia, or a level of expression program, and assess quantitatively how and if these factors impact growth. In situ profiling technologies have done an astonishingly good job capturing differences in cancer cell states and environments. However, the associated, associated meanings of this heterogeneity have been much more challenging to derive. We need to be able to link these state measurements to meaningful biological factors like fitness. Approaches like Stevo can be this crucial link. However, uncovering spatial drivers of tumor growth is just the tip of the iceberg of what we envision we can do by modeling processes on cancer phylogenies, especially since a lot of the necessary data is already available across multiple cancer types. So we want to build tools that take spatial positions of sequences and reconstruct the full history of a tumor spatiotemporally. This will permit us to revisit the spatial and genetic organization of tumors at unsampleable times in tumor history and help us understand the changes in cell motility associated with metastatic potential. We want to develop tools to detect natural selection in these tumor phylogenies, so we can anticipate which tumor clones are likely to drive cancer progression. And we want to use coalescent patterns in these reconstructed trees to be able to distinguish between multiple models of tumor growth, and critically, understand how they change over the course of development. While these are broad and ambitious goals, we have a strong rationale for their potential insights given how successful related methodologies have been in viral epidemiology. So, in cancer, like in HIV, New approaches that we've developed, or are in the process of developing, to leverage spatial cancer data have already revealed major spatial drivers of tumor growth. But we really believe that this holds true more generally. I didn't have time to talk about this today, but we're doing similar spatial analyses to understand bacterial persistence in the lungs of people with cystic fibrosis, and understand how measles enters and adapts across the brain. While it's ambitious to work across systems, I consider this a strength of our research program. In considering diverse systems, we can borrow insights from one system and port them to another. For example, our measles analysis leans on clonal deconvolution approaches from cancer, and our cancer approaches exploit methodological breakthroughs from viral epidemiology. So we're not a cancer lab or an HIV lab or a bacteria lab, but a spatial evolution lab focused on designing evolutionary approaches to better understand, treat, and prevent disease. By working integratively, we're building an expanded arsenal of approaches to tackle spatial data quantitatively across systems. Now that we can measure it, we're consistently finding that space does matter, and understanding its impact on intrahost evolution allows us to design more durable interventions and derive mechanistic and actionable insights into disease progression. Over the next decade, my research program will develop the computational infrastructure necessary to interrogate space's effects in clinical data. However, our vision is even broader, because our long-term objective will be to encompass the spatial organization, organization not just of disease-causing populations, but the immune responses and healthy microbiome communities that can keep them contained. Because ultimately, it will only be through incorporating multiple spatially complex and interacting evolutionary processes that we can fully mitigate the extremely diverse challenges emerging in human health. 
To close, I want to thank the fantastic students and postdoc I work with at the University of Washington, our extensive clinical and experimental collaborators, and you for your consideration. Thanks very much.